I rarely talk about this. I hope I'm not the only one. Where do you go when you dream? Do you remember your dreams? Is there anything about your dreamscape that stands out to you? I've always felt different. Like I have an extra sense or frequency that I can't quite identify. I've had the ability to sense bad situations and feel when people are being untrue or unfaithful to me. I've been able to tell what song will come on the radio next and frequently have streetlights black out when I walk past them. I'm not a believer in the paranormal or in psychic abilities. However, I can't deny the feeling that there is something more there that I can't see. I've always slept normally and had what I considered to be normal dreams. They were never linked to each other in any way. However, I have always had the ability to recount my dreams with incredible accuracy. Approximately four years ago, when I would fall asleep, I would enter a familiar place. This place is huge. For the sake of this story, let's say it isn't the size of a community or a city, but approximately the size of a whole country. Also, for the sake of this, I'm gonna call this place my dream country. There are cities, towns, identifying markers and places that I'm familiar with in my dreams. However, none of these locations have names. I'm able to travel freely around my dream country and I'm fairly lucid while doing so. However, I never realized that I'm dreaming. There are people there that I am familiar with that they have no names and we have often worked together to complete tasks or do fun and thrilling things and even just sit and talk. My whole dream country is familiar to me. It feels like home. I enjoy going to sleep every night, feeling that I'm going somewhere welcoming. I never do the same thing twice in my dreams, and the subject matter is ever evolving. I love this place like a second home, and although I feel I know about every part of it, occasionally I'll discover a new area that's unexplored, and it will become absorbed and part of my dream country. There are a few things I know for certain about my dream country, and that is one, I never have my phone, ever. It doesn't even seem to be something that exists to me or anyone else in this place. Two, no matter what I'm doing, I'm familiar with where I am and who I'm with, even if not by name. Three, usually no one from my real life is in my dreams. We'll reflect on this later. Four, I never dream of places I've actually been to. Five, my dream self has a very deep sense of feelings and obligation to help others. And six, if I ever encounter a place in the real world that I have seen in my dream country, avoid that place at all cost. When this all started with my dream country, I felt that it was something that would pass. A phase in my life that I couldn't control. But now that it's been going on for over four years, I've accepted that it is not a phase and my subconscious is taking me somewhere beyond my control. I've learned things about myself from my dreamscape that I don't think the living physical me could have comprehended by myself. I've learned lessons, had struggles, and fought through emotions in my dreams. After about two years of these dreams, things started to get more strange. One day, I was driving with my wife as a passenger in an unfamiliar stretch of highway between Dallas, Texas and San Antonio, when I suddenly was completely and totally aware of where I was. I had just driven into a place that I had never physically been to before, but was in fact part of my dream country that I had been to in my dreams many times before. I had an extreme sense of foreboding that I needed to leave the area immediately and never go back. So I did just that and detoured two hours out of the way home to get away from that area. It was at this point that I obviously had to tell my wife about my dreams and why I just had to divert two hours and a hundred miles out of the way home. I told her about everything, everything I had kept to myself and never told anyone about. My dreams, my feelings, my sense of some sort of frequency that I can't quite get in tune with. Fortunately for me, she was more intrigued by it than concerned and she has accepted it as part of who I am. We've been married for over 10 years now and she's the best thing in my life and my biggest advocate. Now, back to the dreams. Since the experience of encountering part of my dream in real life, I've not had a similar experience. 
I have an extreme sense of foreboding that it may happen again, and if it does, to avoid the area at all cost. I can't explain why I feel this way, it's just always there. Over time, weird things continue to happen in my dreams that would correlate with things that would happen later in the real world. I wouldn't call it psychic or predicting the future as much as just sensing something would happen. Or a dream would brace me for something that was about to come, be it good or bad. I started paying closer attention to my dreams to see if I could learn something from them. About three years into my dream country, something happened that had never happened before. I recognized two people by name and face that I knew from the real awake world. They were prior employers of mine, and although I knew them, the landscape around them was completely foreign and new. I had never been to this place before, but I had a horrible feeling about it. They kept trying to get me to come back to work for them, and I kept turning them down over and over, because I had a horrible feeling about everything. That something bad was going to happen. Eventually, I was able to convince them to leave the area to what I thought was a better place for them, and I specifically remember feeling relieved for them, like they were safe. These dreams continued intermittently for a few months here and there, not every night. My home state was devastated by fires this last summer. The worst fires out area had never been seen, and hundreds of thousands of acres of land burned. I watched as the fire surrounded the business where I used to work, as they evacuated everyone from the area. I somehow knew that even though this was a horrible event, somehow it would be okay for them. As the fires died down and the smoke cleared, one of the only surviving areas was 50 acres of land in which their business stood. Not a single ounce of it was burned. After all of this happened, I haven't dreamed of them again since, and I get this feeling that for some reason, they were put into my dreams for a reason, and I knew things would be okay for them. This is the only time someone from the outside awake world that I know or knew has entered my dream country. Now, after reading all of this, please know that I am a totally normal, rational person. I had a fairly traditional upbringing, although we were poor. I was bullied all through school for being different, although I never really understood what was different about me as opposed to everyone else. I joined the military at 17 years old to toughen myself up, and boy did it ever work. It also framed me up for a tough, no-nonsense, rational mindset that the military works hard to instill in its soldiers. After the military, I went on to college, got happily married to my dream woman, had three amazing children, and a professional career as a business management expert. I know it isn't rational or normal to have these thoughts and feelings. I have encountered abuse, PTSD, and seen and done things that I'm not proud of, and I try to use these experiences as a way to rationalize my dreams. But the thing is, I never dream about these experiences or places. I have no rational way to explain my dreams, feelings, or senses. I feel like if I tell others that they'll think I'm crazy. The only person I've ever told was my wife, and I still keep it to myself mostly. I want to know if anyone else out there experiences this. I'm not crazy. I know I'm not. I don't believe in mediums or psychics, but I can't deny this whole experience and just write it off as it is what it is. I've been experiencing this for so long now that I believe something more is going on that I can't quite tap into. Sometimes I catch myself wondering if I'm tapping into an alternate dimension and seeing another version of myself. And other times, I catch myself wondering if I'm actually dreaming the real world, and my sleep self is actually the real me. If I think too much about it, it starts feeling like an inception, and I have to snap myself out of it. I love my dream country. I love going there every night. I have a home there that I know is my own, and people that I know are friends. I have places that I love to frequently visit, and places that I like to avoid. I have a whole sense of self in there that only exists in that plane. It's too complicated to try and describe all of it through text, but I would love to talk to someone about it over phone, in person, or live chat. I'm not crazy. Is there anyone else who experiences this? Is there anyone out there who studies these phenomena that I could talk to to try to figure this out? 
Is there someone out there who knows someone like this? Are there scientists or professionals who can explain what's going on? I can't be the only one. Someone out there has the answers, and that's the reason I'm reaching out. I'd like to remain anonymous, just for the fact that this is my first ever time reaching out, or telling people my story, and I'm scared that I'll be made fun of, demeaned, or ostracised in some way, shape, or form. I'm not scared of my dreams or how I feel. I just want to know why, how, and if there are others. Please help. I recently moved into my first home out of college with my boyfriend. It seemed like a great neighbourhood and the house was really nice. But then, as soon as we started moving in, we got an uneasy feeling. Our neighbours would watch us as we moved in, but not in a normal way, if that makes sense. Like as soon as we started moving stuff, one of our neighbours would come out of her house, plant a chair on the lawn and watch us. Even now, every time I glance at this particular neighbour's house, I see her peeking through the blinds watching me. She's not the only strange neighbour though. I've had multiple people from the neighbourhood come up to me that I had never met, come up and ask me about me and my boyfriend's jobs. They already knew where we worked before we had any conversation with our neighbours. I had plans with friends for Independence Day and as I was getting ready to pull out of the driveway, I saw my neighbour suddenly standing outside my car window. He asked me, are you trying to leave? I told him yes, I'm going to a 4th of July party. Then he said, well we have the street blocked off, so you won't be able to leave. I said, well my boyfriend is going to have to leave because he works tonight. And he said, well, I guess we can remove the roadblocks. But just so you know, we have a 4th of July party every year. And the roadblock wasn't a big deal. And I don't know this wasn't that weird. But as I was driving away, a kid threw a firecracker at my car. Just odd. One night, about a month after we moved in, my friends and I were hanging out on my deck, having a few beers and talking. Then we heard sirens and saw an ambulance and police officers driving across the neighbourhood. We weren't super concerned until they pulled up to one of our other neighbours' houses. The woman who lived there was on her porch, screaming and crying to the officers. Sobbing and yelling, I cut him down, I cut him down. Then they loaded her husband's body into the ambulance while we watched. We learned later that he had hung himself and he died. The wife of the man who had died was very strange as well. She would randomly, not extremely often, but enough for it to be a pattern, would wander out of her house late at night around the neighbourhood. We learned from our one normal neighbour that her wanderings happened long before the husband had killed himself. Finally, we have odd happenings in our house sometimes, where the lights flicker, our smoke alarms randomly go off, and I've even woken up with scratches up and down my arms. One night, I was laying on the couch and had fallen asleep. I woke to the sound of someone in the kitchen, and in my sleepy state, I assumed it was my boyfriend. But then I called his name, and I heard no answer. I called again and asked what he was doing. But then I looked in the kitchen and saw no one. Then, as soon as I looked, the deck light outside turned on. My boyfriend came out of our room and asked if I had heard someone in the kitchen too. I was creeped out, but I got up and went to the door by the deck to shut off the light. But when I did, I saw a neighbour directly across the yard on her own deck, standing perfectly still, staring at me. I was super spooked because it was late, like 2.30am at this point, and she was fully outside, posted and staring. She wasn't doing a task and wasn't smoking. Nothing. Just standing and staring. I quickly shut off the lights and then went around to all the doors to make sure they were locked. But when I got to the front door, it was unlocked and opened three inches. Which makes no sense. Because we have a habit of shutting and locking the doors every time we come inside, whether night or day. I locked it and we looked around the house to make sure no one was in there. We slept in our room with the door locked that night. I don't know what to make of our experiences at this point. Every neighbour mentioned in this post is a different neighbour, and the whole neighbourhood just has an off vibe. My friends think, and I hate to think this, 
that my neighbours are somehow involved in the strange instances in the house, and that they aren't necessarily watching me when they're staring, but rather watching whatever entities or vibes or whatever are in the house. For context, I've been watching a lot of BuzzFeed Paranormal videos because they're entertaining, but they also remind me of everything paranormal I've ever been through. I like to remember my experiences to relate to the experiences they're talking about, but tonight I made an intense realisation that made goosebumps shoot down my arms. I've always had a strange reaction to specifically the paranormal. I'm a 20 year old man that has only really cried when an extreme emotional event happens. Death in the family, hard breakups, etc. But whenever I hear something unreasonably paranormal, my eyes randomly produce tears. Could be a ghost story, could be someone talking about a ghost experience. I don't feel scared at all. I actually feel calm with a feeling of being unnerved. I really don't understand why this happens. Keep this in mind because it kind of ties into this. I've always had a weak immune system and it was worse as a kid. This one time I was incredibly sick and bedridden to the point of hallucination. I saw a hawk fly into my window that didn't exist, but most notably I saw a full scale apparition. I mean, it didn't even look like a traditional ghost. It wasn't see through, it wasn't staring at me or talking to me about anything. If I could describe it, it was like when the white blood cells travel across your eye as it moves that way. This apparition had long flowing blonde hair, flowing as if she were underwater. Weird fact, because I'm studying to be a marine biologist and will most likely have a job close to the sea, but I digress. She was wearing a wedding dress and as soon as I saw her, my mind went, I will marry this woman one day. The apparition then phased through a door and disappeared. Pretty creepy, but I chalked it up to being delusional thoughts of a child that's incredibly sick. Fast forward at least six years. I have a shelf on my wall that holds nerdy things. In particular, a bottle of Juggernog from the Call of Duty series. I got up from my bed to do something, and I noticed the bottle is missing from the shelf. As soon as I realised this, the bottle comes zooming past my head from behind me, as if someone had thrown it. It doesn't shatter, it just hits the carpet, but I remember it spinning past my head. There's zero possibility it dropped from the shelf. It was standing at least two feet away from it and it landed nowhere near where it would land. Even if it had fallen, it would have fallen on my desk below the shelf and shattered. I was calm for zero reason. I checked my closet, which was the direction it came from. Nothing. My mind went, intruder in my closet? Nope. Okay. I placed the bottle back on the shelf and walked away. My intense realization was the ghost woman in the wedding dress disappeared in the exact same location the bottle would have been thrown from. And both times, I was incredibly calm, even though I had experienced someone throwing something at me, as well as seeing a full scale apparition. I don't know what to make of this realization. I'm out of that house as it's my parents' house and nothing malicious has ever happened to us, so I'm not worried. The only typical Indian burial ground scenario to explain any of this is that the house is built on land where the civil war was fought, but I don't find that really relevant. This is one of the many strange occurrences that happened in that house, but nothing else is worth mentioning. I just wanted to share this realization to some people who might find it interesting. This story takes place in 2016, when I was a paratrooper with the 1st Brigade 82nd Airborne, stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I had dabbled in psychedelics since high school, but had never experienced leaving my body. In the army, my psychedelic usage only increased, considering that LSD and mushrooms did not show up on drug tests. It was December, and I had recently stocked up on about 30 hits of acid. I had been taking acid consecutively only leaving enough time in between treats to get an effect. Anyway, it was on Monday, and we had a day and night range planned from 0400, weapons drawn going into a night shoot. It was sick, 
of the grunt life. So I had the idea of making my day at the range a little more fun by dropping a bunch of acid. I took four 125 microgram tabs at around 0530 and I kept three in my breast pocket just in case I wasn't feeling a strong enough trip. Transportation for the range showed up around seven o'clock. This is when I first noticed the acid creeping in. I remember leaning against my rook, seeing my first sergeant walk outside our company operating facility. His entire face was shifting and I knew it was hitting. We hopped on the trucks and headed to the range down Long Street. First thing we had to do when we arrived was zero our rifles. I was an E4 team leader, an assistant gunner to be exact. This meant I was not closely watched by the non-commissioned officers and I could zero my rifle unharassed. I looked down at my ACOG and attempted to get a good sight picture. I couldn't, everything was swaying. I fired my three rounds for a grouping and waited for the range to go cold. My grouping was shit, but there was no way in hell I was shooting again. I didn't wish to draw attention of anyone who might have thought I needed help shooting. I grabbed my target and left back to where we put down our rooks. Now at this time, I also smoked a spice vape. Yeah, I know that shit is horrible, but I was a dumb fuck who loved weed and spice was an alternative that would not make me piss hot. I could smoke spice literally anywhere because its odor was non-distinguishable from other vapes. So there I was standing in a circle around my platoon's rooks with about five or six other people from my platoon smoking and joking. I was really upset that I was at the range, but at this point I decided to let go of my animosity and just enjoy the heavy dose of LSD. I remember just standing and staring off into the distance until I finally caught the eyes of one of my sergeants, Sergeant Outlaw. I didn't dislike Outlaw, but sometimes he could be a nosy prick. Our eyes locked in and he came to talk to me. At first, I could understand him. He was asking me how I liked being a team leader now. Then his words became garbled and quick. I heard he did not actually say these things, it's just what I heard him say things like, I know you're on LSD, I know you didn't zero your rifle, first sergeant knows too, and he's coming to get you now. I completely thought that it was Sergeant Outlaw talking to me. I thought I was fucked. But then I started to notice other things that seemed off. I didn't hear the gunfire that was previously chattering in the background anymore. I noticed that no one was moving except for slight idiosyncratic movements. For instance, to my right was Perez, and all I could see him doing was a stationary salsa dance. Even farther to my right was Perez. He was tapping his fingers together and whistling like an evil mastermind, stopping every few seconds to turn in my direction and say, it's coming. Now at this point, I also realized that I couldn't move anything but my eyeballs and slight head movement. After viewing my comrades and their oddities, I finally turned my gaze back to Sergeant Outlaw, but this time he looked different. The major change being his eyes, they were replaced by black swirls. My gaze was stuck on him and I could only feel dread. I remember the voice when he spoke, it was like a loud whisper, it said to me, so you want to take LSD? Do you want to learn the secrets of the universe? All you have to do is look left. At that moment, I noticed my left peripheral getting dark. It was almost like a flashlight of darkness was shining from my left side. The feeling I got from this maelstrom of blackness was terrible. My sense of dread only furthered. I wasn't religious, but I prayed anyway. I remember staring at this entity in the form of my NCO for what felt like five to seven minutes. The entire time I kept repeating to God that I would never take acid again and to please just let me live. Then I felt the control of my head movements slightly turn. When the control returned, I heard voices say, he didn't do it, what a bitch. Plus he didn't want to know. When I heard these voices, my dread disappeared and was replaced with a sense of loss like I missed out on something. I might have replied with, no, wait, I want to know, but I don't remember entirely. But what happened next has been embedded in my memory. I flew out of my body and into the sky. I kept being pulled farther and farther into the sky at speeds unimaginable. 
I remember being pulled across the US, east to west, and then above into space. I arrived at my ethereal destination and landed in a spectral chair in what seemed like a transparent waiting room in space. I could see the earth and the stars straight ahead of me. I could also hear typing, but I couldn't not turn my head to see what was typing. When I arrived in this waiting room, the only feeling I can remember was nostalgia. It was the strongest feeling of nostalgia I've ever felt. I also had thoughts that did not feel like they were my own. No joke, I heard a thought go through my head, saying in a semi-confused yet light-hearted tone, Oh shit, what am I doing back here? I need to get back to my body. Now this thought felt like it came from me, yet I had no conscious decision in making that thought. I sat in the transparent ethereal waiting room for about 10 seconds. After my 10 seconds were up, I immediately appeared back on earth in my body. I was facing left toward where the dark maelstrom emitted from. The first 15 seconds back in my body, I had absolutely no memory of who I was. Then my memories flood back in, bringing me instant relief. I remember thinking, holy shit, I'm a human. My name is Ben. I'm fucking alive. The rest of the day at the range went smoothly. I didn't feel like telling one anyone about my experience at the time. I even ended up taking the rest of the tabs in my pocket because I kind of wanted to see if I could go back. Yes, I was a little horrified at my experience, but more than that, I was intrigued. After that day, I researched OBEs, souls, theology, and metaphysics. I found some answers, but raised more than I found. I had another one three weeks later, again on acid, but this time in a more responsible location, my barracks room. This one was short yet useful because it confirmed my previous experience. I was listening to an EDM artist, Seven Lions, on my headset. And as I started vibing to the music, I closed my eyes and felt myself lift out of my body again. And this time, I could move and look around. I looked around my barracks room and could see that the walls were transparent. I could see into every room in the barracks with their inhabitants doing different things like showering, playing video games, eating or even sleeping. It was wonderful. But the wonder wore off when I remembered the dread I felt from my previous OBE. I instantly snapped back into my body. When I was reattuned with my physical form, my body had instinctively put my hands on the back of my head, as if to be trying to keep my soul connected. I researched this later. I found that souls are connected to our physical forms through a silver ethereal line in the back of our head. I felt satisfied with my discoveries. Still though, this was not my last encounter with the other side. My next OBE was months later on leave. I was back home in LA and it was a lucid dream that had no drugs involved. I'll save that story for another time though. After my experience in December, I had found that my mental state no longer aligned with the ethics of my pr profession. I was an infantryman, closing within and destroying the enemy in close combat was something we all strove for. To understand the story a little background on myself was necessary. When I first joined the army, my motivation for combat came from a place of anger, confusion and personal turmoil. My father raised me with violence, but I allowed his actions to affect and define my character. From 13, I began to self-medicate with anything I could find, from weed and alcohol to pills, MDMA and psychedelics. My junior year of high school, I voluntarily withdrew to attend rehab for an extended Xanax habit. I spent my 17th birthday in a rehab facility in East Texas. At 19, I graduated and joined the Airborne Infantry. I believed I had found my true calling and an outlet for my aggression. Unfortunately for me at the time, going to the war is not a decision made by young privates. After a year of training, my brigade was placed on GRF, Global Response Force, which was at the time a year-long sentence to garrison life. I had found no glory or bloodshed, instead boredom and bureaucracy. I expected war, and I received weekend staff duties and tactical laser tag. So I turned to an old enjoyment of mine, drugs. 
Due to persistent drug tests in the military, I stayed away from most narcotics. LSD and mushrooms became my drugs of choice. Considering psychedelics are not tested for with normal drug tests, I began to push the limits of reality further and further. I loved raving. Taking high doses of acid and dancing my ass off to EDM became a consistent hobby of mine. Eventually, we were slotted for a deployment. We were going to Kandahar. Finally, my goal was in sight, although our deployment was still nine months away. Fuck that. No reason to stop taking psychedelics. It was enjoyable and an excellent way to pass the time. Even with the extensive use of psychedelics, I still retained my jaded mentality. My psychedelic usage culminated in December of 2016, when my consciousness disconnected from my physical form and was pulled back into a transcendental state in which I was given a glimpse into the world beyond. After returning from the other side, I found my headspace to be completely different. The newly found empathy and love gave me a positive purpose and direction. I was amazed at the information I had been blessed with. I witnessed firsthand that there was something beyond this life, although more than seeing it, I had felt it. It was the deepest self-reflection I had ever experienced, and after, I found I no longer had the gall to take human life and here laid my moral dilemma. Our deployment to Kandahar was slotted for the summer of 2017. I was a team leader, an assistant gunner to be exact. I oversaw a machine gun team, which is a crucial part of the infantry platoon. The responsibility of my position weighed on me. Although I knew everything about the war was wrong, it used to have never bothered me, for I didn't care about the military industrial complex profiting off the war. In my old mindset, I only cared about satisfying my desires for violence. After my experience, I couldn't even fathom killing another human, for I knew it was inherently wrong. Honestly, it was an embarrassment that made me decide to revert to my old ways. I killed the good that was fostered inside of me out of fear of embarrassment. As Tim O'Brien said in The Things They Carry, I would go to the war. I would kill and maybe die, because I was embarrassed not to. I now empathise with Mr O'Brien, for I too was a coward. I knew it was wrong, and I decided to go to war. Changing my mindset wasn't difficult. If you understand that the universe is mental, and that thoughts control our world, nothing is impossible. Not using psychedelics anymore was also useful in reverting my ways of thought. Now. This is where the story really begins. It was early June 2017. I was on pre-deployment leave in my hometown of Santa Monica, California. My parents were living in Italy at the time, so I decided to spend my leave in California with my aunt and my friends. My aunt owned a successful escrow business in Santa Monica. She lived in a beautiful condo at the corner of Ocean and California, overlooking the Pacific. She spoiled the fuck out of me while I was there, considering I was about to deploy. I had been on leave for at least a week when the incident occurred. I was watching TV with my aunt while having a glass of Dom Perignon. She bought that shit like water. I had exactly one glass and that was it. My aunt was tired and she went to bed. Even though I was tired and I had a bedroom to sleep in, I remained on the couch. I felt incredibly comfortable on the couch, so I decided to just lie on my back and slip into slumber. I fell asleep almost instantaneously. What woke me was unexpected. My arm had fallen off the open side of the couch, and I felt something licking it, like a small dog. My aunt had a cat, but the licking was incessant and didn't feel like the rough tongue of a feline. I rose from the couch to view it. It was a small dog. It looked akin to a miniature schnauzer, except for one defining feature. It had no skin. The creature hurried away as I rose from the couch. After standing up, I noticed that my blanket was still on the couch and had not fallen off when I stood up. But the blanket looked larger than I remembered, more puffed up like there was a mass of something under it. It finally registered. The mass was me. I was under the blanket. The moment I realised I was separated from my body, although my attention was drawn by something across the room, 
It was the skinned dog hurrying into the dining room. I followed it. When I reached the dining room, I immediately noticed her. At first, she was standing. She stood at about 5'7", was lanky, with long white hair and endless wrinkles going down her grey skin. She crouched down behind the table and when she saw me, she looked like Hergraven from Skyrim. As creepy as this all might sound, fear was not my first instinct. After my experience in December, I was more interested than afraid. I had done research about spirits and entities since then, and I was fully aware that I was responsible for letting them affect me. My thoughts and energy kept me safe, and as I approached the woman, I walked to the same side of the table as her. She scuttled away into the corner of the room as I approached. I chuckled and was pretentiously impressed at the strength of my astral form. I was ready to test my limits. Remembering my research on lucid dreaming, I wanted to attempt to create things in my astral form. I could have tried a million different things. I could have tried flying around Los Angeles in the Pacific Ocean. But no, I was still fucked in the head. I decided to create two humans and a pistol so I could kill them. I was psyched up for deployment. All I wanted to do was get my first kill. So why not do a test run? All it took was the thought. I thought about it and it transpired. I created two men dressed in suits and a Glock 19 in my hand. I fired two rounds into each man, center mass. Immediately, my vision went white, blindingly so, like a flashbang in Call of Duty. I heard a voice, a loud but calm and familiar voice. All it said was, you can't kill people in lucid dreams. You're not supposed to do it. Instantly, I snapped back into my body. It was 7.30 a.m., the sun was up, and my aunt was cooking breakfast. I walked into the kitchen and saw her cooking something. I was famished and happy to be finally be awake from my lucid dream. She asked me if I'd like breakfast. I attempted to respond. I couldn't speak. She asked again. I tried again, no change. I put my hand to my mouth only to realize that I had no mouth. I started to violently shake and vibrate my vocal cords in an intense, muffled scream. And then I awoke. For real this time. I was back on the couch. It was dark. I sat up and looked at the clock on the DVR. It was 3.33am. The hour of the devil. I understood the significance of the time and returned to sleep hastily. I left Los Angeles a week later. I went to Afghanistan in late June. I saw combat, but I never killed anyone, but not for lack of trying. I returned in 2018, and with a year left on my contract, I began to prepare for my new life. I resumed using psychedelics, but in a more responsible manner. My introspective trips kindled my positive mindset. More importantly though, I fell love. I met her in the summer of 2018. Now we're married. I'm now pursuing a degree in philosophy with the goal of spreading the truth of my message. We're more than corporal mass. We are eternal beings. This reality is a medium for our spirit to learn and grow. The first experience I ever had with this creature clicked in my head and has made me shift my idea on how the entity became attached to me. At first, I believed it was because I used a Ouija board, and a few days after I noticed the presence, a lot more, but no. I've later remembered I did a guided third eye meditation, which is no longer on YouTube, and I'm glad it's not, because if this happened to someone who wasn't as capable with energy, I would be very worried. The meditation I did about four and a half years ago was very strange. I remember laying down in my bed and listening to the voice on the video. I asked you to start breathing in a very strange way. You had to almost have a shaking breathing style and listen to audios I've never heard on any other guided or non-guided meditation. And I've participated in endless amounts of them. During the meditation, I felt and envisioned a large black hand with long nails on the left side of my chest. It felt as if I was sitting up in my bed and I could feel the hand push me gently back down to the bed. 
I didn't want to break the meditative state. And even though my heart began to race, I continued to keep my eyes closed and I followed till the end of the meditation when I could hear the voice giving cues to wake up again. After sitting up, all I could see was a strange purple aura around everything I looked at. This comes into play later. After that meditation, I never really noticed the energy or hand again until fast forward a few years to when I used the Ouija board. A few days after using the board, I started to feel a very ang angry masculine presence on the far corner of my garage, the same garage I used the board in. I paid no mind to it really at first due to the fact ever since I was a child I'd been having experiences and feeling energies, so at that point I was accustomed to it. The energy started to become more comfortable with my presence and I began to no longer feel that negative energy. I can feel a very heavy energy in my stomach and chest, but it's no longer dark and negative. After a few months of feeling the presence every day, it began, for lack of better language, trying to fuck with me, more in a childish yet more powerful way than I've ever felt any other energy do. This energy, I strongly believe, is the most powerful I have ever personally encountered, and possibly will ever encounter. The entity would always be behind me when I was walking to the garage, the door to leave. Many times, I would go to open the door and it would close itself. I could feel the entity behind me and I started to talk aloud to it from then on. I don't get verbal responses that I can hear or responses sometimes at all. It's more the entity will do something in response to my words or will shift the energy I'm feeling is to give a response. The entity definitely likes to use doors the best when it wants my attention, but it has actually touched me like the meditation and another few times. I was with my friend at probably 2 a.m. in our small town in the grocery store parking lot on our bikes. We didn't want to drive since it was summer and we were taken in the fresh air. I closed my eyes while standing in the empty parking lot. I was hovering over my bike and my friend was beside me. All of a sudden, I felt those same black hands with sharp nails gently on my lower back. I immediately opened my eyes and looked to my friend who could immediately see something had happened. I asked if she had touched me, which she said no, since she was beside me the whole time. She would start to sometimes feel the entity's energy around me. One time, I was driving probably a couple weeks after the parking lot incident, and she seen the hand come beside my face while I was driving. That same summer, we went on a trip together with two other people. There was a small pond near the Airbnb we were staying at and at about 3am we were about to go to the pond and one of the people we were with yelled Hail Satan into the pond forested area. I told my friend after that that the entity was planting the idea in my head that we shouldn't go in there. I was feeling super heavy and as I said that she had a look in her eyes that I won't forget. She mentioned she could see the dark entity wrapping its arms around my shoulders as if to hold me down to not go in. When we went in the pond area anyways, a light from a utility shed kept flashing on and off a total of three separate times. My friend and I knew we all had to pack up our stuff and leave the bench we were sitting on. We left the pond and the next day, the other two people on the trip, who aren't very spiritually inclined or open to it, left for the day. And my friend and I went back to the pond we both had an overwhelming need for whatever reason. We noticed the bench we were sitting on the night before was a memorial bench and the two others had disrespected that space and that's why the entity was trying to get me to leave the pond that first night. Fast forward to around October 2019. I started dating my significant other and my friend from before was at my significant other's house with me and her boyfriend at the time. We were all sitting at the kitchen table and the door behind us opened by itself. My friend looked at me and said, hey. So I replied, that's not very nice, sir. Close the door. Needless to say, everyone almost died of shock when the door immediately closed. This is when I started to really know that this entity is very, very real. It will do things in front of the people I'm around and not just in front of me. That was what really stuck in my head. 
Other small experiences included the shower curtain blowing open when I was showering, the screen door to my house holding open once I swung it open and there was no wind, a door near my entryway always opens when I haven't paid much attention to the entity's presence and it wants to remind me. When I was watching the nun, he mimicked the hands over my face in the coffin scene to mock the Christian demons and movie and I could go on. I think you get the idea. This entity I notice has a purple aura, which is what made me realize that it was attached to me, most likely because of meditation. Anyways, this entity is still always around me. Just yesterday, I got goosebumps and chills over my entire body when I was in a down mood, and I could feel the entity directly behind me, not trying to drain my energy, but I was feeling very alone and it was almost like it was trying to comfort me. I've decided that I'm not going to try and cleanse this energy away and I'll let it stay for as long as it feels since I'm not being drained. It's not hurting anyone and I see no need to detaching the entity if it doesn't want to go and it isn't doing anything. I've been attached to me fully up to three years now and it's a normal part of my daily life. Background. I went to get my flu shot from a small clinic by a commercial lab. I was one of a few people there waiting for them to open up, for those of us with nothing else better to do on a Friday night. What happened? After waiting about 10 minutes, they started processing us and I was second in line. I took note of the guy ahead of me because unlike the rest of us, he blew past the sign that said they weren't ready yet and took a seat inside the processing area. There was one staffer in there and he sat straight across from her and I thought that was slightly peculiar, but just enough to make me notice him. When I did, a couple other things stood out. He seemed nicely dressed for getting a flu shot and was wearing a long sleeve button up shirt with a somewhat noisy pattern on it. Just weird in terms of level of dress and wearing long sleeves to get a shot. I finished my quick screening and am led down the hall and into a room that had been converted by adding a temporary cubicle space for shot stations. I see the guy and he's getting his shot and seems kind of distressed about it and is sort of flexing his arms strangely. Some people can't take needles though, so that's not inherently unusual. I go to the other side of the cubicle wall and get mine done like lightning. I'm up in time to go start following this guy to the door marked as the exit. They wanted patients to leave a different route presumably to keep social distance to a maximum. He seemed confused for a split second as if he was going the right way, but then swiftly walked out the door. I followed behind, maybe three or five seconds, no more than that. I followed the very clearly marked path around a corner and into a long hall. This guy must have moved very fast because I couldn't see him anywhere. But then about two seconds later, I did. He leaned very suddenly from around a corner appearing to first look past me and then at me. He seemed nervous, but I couldn't read his facial expression well due to the mask. Just as quick, he jerked back behind the corner. I thought maybe he was lost and was just peeking around to maybe see where others were going to get out. I continue walking and then I get to the corner and no one is there. Before, I thought there must have been a hallway or door there that I didn't remember. I've been to this location several times, but no, solid white wall. The corner itself is shallow, maybe two and a half feet deep, just wide enough to hide someone from the viewing angle I had. There were only two doors on that side of the hall. One is just before the corner and it was very clearly shut and locked, I would think. The other one is further down and was also shut. That door leads into a very small waiting room that was very obviously closed and very dark inside. I heard no sound during all of this, not a footstep, not a door handle turning or a door closing. Nothing. So I used to talk on Ouija boards all the time. It's been about six years since the last time I used one. So I grew up Catholic, did all the steps as a child to an adult to become a member of the Catholic Church. 
been baptized, etc., blessed all the time, etc. Even had a priest come to the house for dinner once a year and bless our house. Then I started using the Ouija board one day when I was 20 years old at my parents' house. It was fun talking on it, and I would talk on it quite often, every day just about. I met something there that knew the answers to everything. After talking on it and to that thing for a few months, it would talk to me about God. I always thought it was weird, because everyone said these are bad or evil. It would tell me how God loves me, how he protects me, how he watches over me, etc. When it would bring God up, I would get this feeling through my whole body. It's this feeling I've felt before, but not as strong as it was coming through the boredom. The feeling starts inside my body. It's this tingly sensation feeling. I can't explain it. Sometimes it would be so strong and warm, it would bring tears of joy to my eyes. It's a good feeling to feel. Always thought it was weird. I kept going to church and now every time I think of God or pray, I get that feeling. Sometimes it's stronger than others. Well, it's been a few years since I've been on a Ouija board and I don't go to church really anymore. I felt that feeling a few times. But last night, I got a notification. Suggested pages I'd like on Reddit. It was a Ouija experience thread. As I was reading and posting about my experiences, I had a rosary hanging on my wall. The rosary bounced off the wall. Long and banging against the wall like it was swinging. This had never happened before. It's like how it did that. It's been hanging there for a long time and never moves. And now it banged against the wall and swaying back and forth. Not only that, but when I got that weird sensational feeling and it was strong, real strong, and it overpowered my body and made me cry again, I really can't explain it. As I talk about it or write this as it happened a couple times, not strongly, just a light version. Has anyone else ever experienced this feeling I'm talking about? I always think it's God protecting me or talking to me or loving me. It's hard to explain. The only reason I stopped talking on the Ouija board is because it kept telling me not to talk on it anymore because God didn't want me on it and just things about God and plans he has for me and to not get on this. And every time it says the same thing, God don't want you on this. So I stopped getting on it. For around a year now, I've been hearing a lot of sounds at night, and when I'm alone in my house, my room becomes freezing cold when the rest of my upstairs stays warm. My room is always very hot, and I get the feeling I'm being watched. Now I'm a skeptic, and don't really believe in anything after death. So normal when weird things happen, I can connect sounds and things moving to the house is settling, or I must have moved it but I forgot about it. But there are many things that I cannot explain. I've woken up multiple times to shit in the room next to mine going crazy and my dog staring at my door confused and scared. Every time this happens, I check my phone and it's always between 3 and 4 a.m. But I don't want to get into the house those stories now. I want to talk about what happened today. So my family left and I was home alone with me and my dog, sitting on the sofa watching some TV. Then I heard a wow from upstairs. Me and my dog made a, what the fuck? It was that eye contact, but then a thought came into my mind that, oh, my brothers are still here, but have not heard my parents on the VR. So I got up to tell them everyone left. Walking upstairs, I realized that no one was on the VR because the light was off and you need light for the sensors to work. So I looked around for a bit to make sure it wasn't a prank, then got an idea. I've been watching a lot of ghost hunting shit because I'm bored as fuck. So I say, why don't I do an EVP session to see if anything happens? So I got my phone turned on and began asking questions. I ask, did you make the wow noise? What's your name? And are you scared? Nothing happened when I asked for it, but the record had a lot of bangs that I didn't hear. But I thought nothing was happening, so I asked if it could make a noise or bang on a wall. Then, I heard a small thud from my brother's room, run over to look in the room and there was nothing there. So 
so I weirded out now. I thought that this was just lucky timing, so I left the room and asked again, and it happened again. I ran into the room, looked under the bed in the crawl space, and found nothing, and no one. When you walk into my kitchen at night, a gut-wrenching, menacingly sinking feeling hits you with an unexplainable force. It sticks with you the whole time you're there, and leaves the moment you're out. Late last year, I began to pay attention to this feeling and its patterns. I never really thought about the paranormal. I wasn't a skeptic really, it just didn't cross my mind, ever. So when I discovered how in touch I am with paranormal beings, it really changed my perspective on things. As I got more and more in touch, I realised there was a presence in my kitchen. It only came out at night, for the feeling brought along with it was only there at that time. It had the same schedule every day. Around 9 o'clock every night it showed up, staying until early morning, about 7am. I figured the spirit, though I sensed it to be dark, wasn't going to change its habits anytime soon, and tried my best to become more accustomed to it. Looking back, I now understand I never quite could. One cold night around 2 in the morning, I grabbed my water bottle and walked my way downstairs. My eyes were adjusted to the dark, and I took quiet, slow steps down the old carpet-covered staircase. Here, I must explain a bit of the layout, and I hope it makes decent sense. Upstairs are four doors. On one side, there's a hall leading to a bathroom, and just before it's a door to a bedroom. On the other side are two doors at a corner to one another. Each leads to separate bedrooms, and mine is the one facing the previously mentioned door on the other side of the wall. A staircase in the middle of this hall descends down halfway, and then takes a sharp 180 degree turn fully down to the first floor. An open layout lies at the bottom. The kitchen sits in front of you. To the left it almost a pocket is the kitchen. To the right is a wide living room. With that out of the way, I get to the second to bottom step and look to the kitchen. The side of the refrigerator sticks out, causing it to be visible from the stairs. It's the type with the water dispenser on it. I freeze. Right below the dispenser, I'm met with a face. Some, someone, something, is hunched over an awkward crouch, staring at me with eyes I'll never be able to forget. The whites of them glow slightly, making this shadowy figure all that much more disturbing looking. I reach my hand out and turn on the light to the stairs quickly. It's gone. I stare, unable to fully process what I've just witnessed. Was I going crazy? Perhaps I was tired. I didn't feel tired though, and deep down I knew I was fully awake. I walk to my fridge hesitantly, the overwhelming familiar feeling I've mentioned hitting me once more. I fill my water bottle and I leave. The feeling does not go away. Never in the time I've lived in this house has this happened. The feeling, the presence, had always and only stuck to the kitchen. It was impossible, I thought, yet here it was, following me up the stairs and down the hall to my room. I'm struck with dooming fear. Without thinking, I rushed into my room, repeating in my head and aloud that whatever was with me was forbidden to enter my room. Slamming the door, I rushed to my bed and processed what happened, feeling the presence lighten. What did happen? I didn't know. I couldn't think. How could I? What was I to do? From that night on, I noticed a break of pattern. The presence moved around, appearing visually more and more. It stood at the bottom of the stairs, then the centre, then the top. Finally, it moved to right outside my door. Currently, it's moving once again, and I'm unable to confidently pinpoint where its new place is. I'm scared to say this, but I believe it's my closet. I have many more stories about my house. I see shadow creatures often, and I feel and hear their presence.
I used to walk a lot at night with my older brother. We lived in a small mountain town in 2003 and felt comfortable going for walks around the neighborhood in the dark, especially in the summer. Before this night, did I always believe in ghosts? Not really. I've always been easily scared, but that's due to watching far too many horror movies at a young age. Never from seeing or feeling a presence. This moment stands in my head so clearly still. We were only a few blocks from home, just reached the peak of a slight hill with the streetlight shining its orange glow around us and the Italian cypress trees all in a row on the opposite side of us in the road. My brother was on my left, I on his right, and we were on the right side of the road. I was talking away, my hand gestures expressive as always, looking towards my brother when suddenly I grabbed onto him, jokingly, and whispered for him to shush, not that he was talking, that a person was nearby and could hear us. There, just opposite us, across the street, a teenage boy in a striped shirt was walking along with us in one of those cypress tree shadows. I don't think even my brother looked. He may have kept his eyes straight, concerned a stranger at night had crept up on us. Stranger though, the moment that teenager in his striped shirt hit the cast of streetlight between the trees, he disappeared. I stopped in my spot, so excited at what just happened. This person, ghost, was gone immediately after I had just seen them. My brother was unfazed. He didn't see anything. He didn't believe in ghosts. A few years later, maybe more, as I walked by a car window and caught my reflection, I pondered on why it made me think back to that summer night. The teenage boy in that striped shirt, he had been like a reflection in clear glass. There, but not whole. My mom hasn't talked about this experience for quite some time, but recently she mentioned it in a bit more detail. For some info, we've lived in our house for maybe 20 years now. It's pretty old, and a few of my uncles and other relatives have lived here. Some of them claimed that our house was haunted. That's a story for another day. Anyway, I wasn't born yet, so sorry if this next part's brief. As I mentioned before, I still don't know all the details. My mom worked the night shift. So she'd be home alone throughout the day mostly. She said this started one day when she was cleaning. She suddenly heard someone call out her name from the direction of our backyard. She glanced out the window but didn't see anyone. She then heard someone call out again, this time from the front yard. She decided not to look out the window this time because she now understood that whatever was out there wasn't good. Mom's not real religious, but she learned from her grandfather to always trust in God. So, she began to recite a short prayer. Then, she heard the voice again, this time as she showered. She said she felt afraid and noticed that it sounded like a woman's voice. She began to pray again. This next one's the scariest of her, of her experiences, in my opinion. She was lying in bed one afternoon, but she couldn't sleep. She had her eyes closed, then suddenly she felt like something was looming over her. She ignored the feeling and tried to go back to her nap. Then, suddenly she felt a warm tongue lick all of her cheek. Obviously at that moment she was terrified. She opened her eyes and saw a black dog, about the height of the bed, standing there panting. She closed her eyes, cried, and again began to ask God for help. I'm not sure, but I think she said that eventually she didn't feel the dog there anymore, but she still kept crying. I recently moved into an old brownstone in Brooklyn, New York. The building is pre-war, over 100 years old. When I first moved in, little stuff started happening, mostly doors opening and closing, which my roommates and I would pass off as the building being old. Recently, I've been having feelings like there's another person in my apartment. Specifically, when I walk from the living area to the kitchen, which is basically just a hallway in those two rooms, I get this feeling like someone is going to be in either room when I walk in. If I'm standing in the kitchen cooking or whatever, I tend to turn around and assume that my roommate or boyfriend is there with me, but there's no one there. That happens kind of often. 
Like I will literally start forming a smile and will go to say something to them, but realize I'm alone. Last week, I was doing dishes when I heard someone humming. I shut the water and gave another listen, and I distinctly heard hmm, hmm, hmm in a higher pitched voice. It was just me in the apartment at this point. It didn't freak me out, but certainly caught me off guard. I told my roommates who confirmed she was on the phone with her dad, which I couldn't hear through the wall anyway. Which brings me to yesterday, when I spoke to my landlord about my experience. His wife asked me if I was empathic. I'm a social worker slash therapist, so I do have high emotional intelligence and read people fairly quickly. I just told her what I feel when in the kitchen and living room areas of the apartment. Y'all, they proceeded to tell me how they had a previous tenant in my apartment who frequently saw a woman walking from those two rooms and they themselves have felt cold breezes between that area as well. We all agreed that it's not a bad or creepy feeling, but still catches you off guard. Before I sat down to write this, I was making coffee in the kitchen when I heard a loud woman's sigh. I don't know y'all, I've never really experienced something like this, so any advice on how to not get creeped out would be great. I also feel like my roommate doesn't really believe me. I've heard other things, but don't tell her because honestly, I don't want to scare her or have her think I'm crazy.